I don't want you to complain that church was too long. All right, so this morning, the message today and the story that goes along with it, some people believe that this is part of the most important week in history. You know, perhaps a theologian might argue that the week of creation was the most important week, or perhaps some specific week in Jesus' ministry might be the most important week in history, but, you know, of course, many people will naturally feel that this story is part of the most important week in history. And I'm going to just take a moment to pause really quickly. Do you mind... Do you mind passing around the sign-up sheet for paper for Easter, putting that on hold, setting it aside, and waiting until after church because I'm deaf and very visual, and the paper being passed around is distracting to me. So just hold on to that real quick. All right, thank you. All right, so backing up to my sermon. So this story I'm excited to share because it's about Jesus and the week that he goes to Jerusalem, and he's very determined, very motivated to go to Jerusalem because there is where Jesus will be crucified in our place. And I think it shows that Jesus willingly died for us. This is not something where Jesus was murdered outside of his will, but Jesus here in this last week is intentionally going to Jerusalem to die on the cross. And so this week starts with a dinner that's being cooked for Jesus in the town of Bethany. And there's three people in the town of Bethany that I'm sure most of you know, Lazarus, Martha, and Mary. And so these three siblings are there, and the dinner is taking place after Lazarus has already been raised from the dead. And so the dinner is serving as a thank you dinner to Jesus. And the Gospels of Matthew and Mark both say that that dinner took place in the house of Simon the leper. So perhaps Jesus clearly already healed Simon, and they've come to this house for a thank you dinner because Jesus had raised Lazarus from the dead. But that dinner was very dangerous because the Jewish authorities had already given the order at the Sanhedrin that anyone who knew where Jesus was had to give up that information on penalty of death. And so they were harboring Jesus, not telling the authorities where Jesus was. And Lazarus himself, one of the people at the dinner, at the table, was openly inviting people to this dangerous dinner. And in fact, the authorities were already saying that if anyone had seen Lazarus, they wanted to know where Lazarus was because they were planning to kill Lazarus. So verse 10 and 11 after this passage says that the chief priests were making plans to kill Lazarus because Lazarus had been talking about Jesus and people had been coming to hear Lazarus speak and believing in Christ because of Lazarus. So obviously Lazarus was doing a good job of giving his testimony about what Christ had done in his life and so the Jewish authorities were planning on killing Lazarus as well. But despite all of that, Lazarus was still inviting people to this dinner. And so it was not a secret that they were hosting this dinner for Jesus. And so the story, though, is not about the bravery of Lazarus to host this dinner. It's not about the dinner itself. But I really think the point of this passage is about Mary. And so that's why I'm excited to share with all of you about Lazarus and Martha's sister, Mary. So we begin with John chapter 12, verses 1 through 2. These verses say, 
Six days before the Passover, Jesus, and by the way, Passover this year will start sundown Monday. So six days before the Passover, Jesus came to the town of Bethany, the home of Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. There they gave a dinner for him. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those at the table with him. And so you've most likely heard the three siblings mentioned in a story before where Martha was the one who served Jesus when Jesus came to visit. And Martha complained because Mary was sitting listening to Jesus and Martha wanted her sister to come work. And so if we remember that story, we see that here again, all three siblings are there. Lazarus is sitting at the table, but Martha is the one serving Martha seems to be a very good servant, very good at serving, but where is Mary? Once again, in this story we see in verse 3, <coughs> Mary took a pound of costly perfume made of pure nard and anointed Jesus' feet and wiped them with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. This is very important. I'm excited about explaining this verse. The nard from which the perfume was made is a type of plant. And this verse has four very big points. And it's so amazing because first, Mary is sitting at Jesus' feet. And Mary knows that she must learn from Jesus. She is a true believer and knew that it was important not to serve, not to cook dinner, not to clean the house. But what was important was learning. She wanted to learn and to have knowledge of the Savior. To want to have knowledge of the kingdom of heaven. To have knowledge of the kingdom that Jesus was establishing on earth. And so she sat at Jesus' feet to learn. Secondly, is that Mary anointed Jesus' feet. Which is puzzling because people were anointed on their heads. And so reading that verse... It's puzzling, but powerful. She's not serving, she's not cleaning, doing the women's duties, but she's sitting, learning, asking questions, and now she anoints Jesus on Jesus' feet instead of his head. Now the third point is that she uses her hair to dry Jesus' feet. And this is strange because at that time, in biblical times, women never let their hair down in front of other people. Never. It was always covered and it was always put back. A woman's hair was hid, but she lets it down to dry Jesus' feet. And the fourth amazing point of the story is that the act of washing a person's feet in the first place is an act of great humility because it was a job reserved for the lowliest of servants. And so we have all these four points that should be shocking to us when we are understanding what exactly it is that Mary is doing. Going to verses 4 through 6, it reads, But Judas Iscariot, one of the disciples, the one who was about to betray him, said, Why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii and the money given to the poor. He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. He kept the common purse and used to steal what was put into it. The first time in all of Scripture, 
that shows what some, something that Judas actually said is criticism. And it's criticism against an act that was beautiful and what was done for Jesus. And we have people like that. We've seen people like that. When other people are giving and offering something to Jesus, others criticize them, saying that they're too holy, that they give too much, that they do too much. People like to criticize and beat people and tear them down so that they can be on the same level, so they don't have to do the same amount of work or the same amount of service. I think we know people exactly like Judas in this passage. Wake up. Yes or no? Do we know people like that? Do we know people who, when others serve and give of themselves, they criticize and complain? But we should not let people tear us down. What we should instead do is to serve and to share of ourselves and what we have in love for our Savior. And so in this passage, Judas is the opposite of Mary, the complete opposite. Later, Judas will sell Jesus for 30 silver pieces, which is the equivalent of 120 denarii. And so that's why we see that Judas truly does not care for the poor, but instead Judas is concerned about having money to serve himself. And I think we know people like that too, people in the church who get involved, who want to do this and this and that, but their true motivation behind it is for the self, for their own benefit. And so they want all of these things, not for the kingdom, not for Jesus, but for themselves. And so that is not what our true motivation should be. So I'm going to show you a picture of the coins. I think this is, is pretty neat in the next slide. So this is a shekel. This was used in biblical times. And you'll see passages speak of the shekel. The shekel is actually still used today as the currency of Israel. So if you go to Israel, they'll still use the shekel. So our dollar currently equals 3.46 shekels. So our dollar equals 3.46 shekels. So they still use that today. And so there was another coin used in biblical times called the denarius. And if it's more than one, you'll see in the passage it was spelled denarii, which references more than one of the coins. The S changes to the double I. And so one coin, the denarius, denarii, more than one. And so it's the same word. And what's interesting about this coin, you'll notice that it's a Roman coin. Julius Caesar, if you know who that is, Julius Caesar is the one who began circulating the denarius in 111 BC using that money. I'm sorry, interpret error, 211 BC until 270 AD, that money was used. And so if you know the story of the Good Samaritan, when the Samaritan came to help the person who had been left by the priest and by the Levite, the Samaritan, when the Samaritan helped bring the abused person to the end, two denarii were used to pay for the care of this man. When we read of the story, of the Roman soldiers who are paid for their work, it uses the denarii, or the farmers who were used for their work in the fields, that was spoken of as one denarii for their work. And so we no longer use the denarius, but the shekel is actually still in circulation. And so looking at verse 7 and 8, Jesus said, leave her alone. 
She bought it so that she might keep it for the day of my burial. You always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. Jesus says, you will not always have me. Perhaps you're wondering how Mary knew that Jesus was going to, deny, going to die soon. That she was going to use this perfume to anoint Jesus for burial. Mary understood the importance of sitting at Jesus' feet and learning from Jesus all that she could. And if you read the Gospels, you'll see that Jesus tried to tell the twelve disciples that he was going to be leaving, that he was going to die, that on the third day he was going to raise from the dead. And he continued to explain this to the disciples, but the disciples weren't listening, they weren't paying attention. But we see in our own Bibles that Mary, obviously, this story was added by the Gospel writers, because Mary obviously understood Jesus and what was going to happen, that Mary had sat on several occasions, had taken time out of the world to sit and listen and to learn from Jesus. And as we conclude this sermon, what I want to do is I want to look at three characteristics of Mary that we need to emulate. The first characteristic is that Mary understood the importance of learning at the feet of Jesus. She knew that all of the duties of life, cooking and cleaning, that sometimes we must take an intentional time out. We have to put life on hold and we need to turn to the teaching of Jesus. We know we have to go to church and Bible study and read the Bible and, and come to a greater awareness and all of those are important. But do we also, on other occasions, take time out and just turn to try to learn from Jesus? I think perhaps not, not really. It's important to understand this, that the Bible mentions several times that Mary sat at the feet of Jesus. And so I think that the English is important here. Sitting at the feet of Jesus. It means sitting before Jesus. I'm imagining Mary sitting before Jesus. And, and what that phrase means, it means that you're learning from the person that you're sitting, that you're sitting with. If you sit at the feet of Debbie, it means you're learning from Debbie. And so when pastors go in, as a visiting pastor, I always tell a visiting pastor that I'm going to be sitting under you. I'm looking forward to sitting under you, meaning I'm looking forward to learning from you. It's not a subordination under, but it means I'm looking forward to sitting at your feet and learning from you. I'm looking forward to being under you today. So pastors say that to each other when they visit each other's churches. And so it comes from this verse, this concept, is that we're just supposed to learn, sitting at the feet. That phrase in Hebrew means you want to learn from that person. And we must discipline ourselves to start sitting at the feet of Jesus. We must. It's not enough to come and to say yes, to listen to the sermon and leave, but we must be able to discipline ourselves, to read scripture, to go to church and church events and go to church studies, to be involved, to go to the Easter egg hunt, and not only for the people with children, but to be part of the church body, to be with one another, to fellowship with one another, and to love one another. And if I don't have the encouragement of everyone on Sunday morning, I don't want to be depressed through the week. I need us together as a body. We need each other. We need to be able to fellowship and feed and encourage one another. And together we must sit at the feet of Jesus and learn and learn 
And Mary understood that Jesus' death was coming because she had been learning. And if there's something we don't understand, it's because we're not sitting at the feet of Jesus enough. The second point, the second characteristic to emulate is that we must, what it says here, we must learn how to give back to Jesus the love with extravagance. Mary used this perfume which was expensive. It was not dollar store perfume. It was not Target or Walmart perfume. It was expensive. But Mary wanted to show that she understood that Jesus was her Savior, that Jesus was about to die, and so she looked for her best possession to give to Jesus in honor. And so she took this expensive perfume, and she knelt at Jesus, and she washed, washed Jesus' feet as if a servant with this expensive perfume, and used her beautiful hair to dry Jesus' feet. She was humble in her sacrifice and giving her best, her absolute best. She gave of her prized possession. And so we need to learn to do the same. Are we like Judas, who might criticize? Can you imagine Judas saying that in front of Jesus to say, what a waste of expensive perfume on the feet of Jesus? I can't imagine that criticism claiming he was giving it to the poor when truly he was taking the money for himself. I can't imagine. And so I ask, are we like Judas? Or are we like Mary? What is our best? What is the best of our time? What is the best of our talent? What is the best, the absolute best of all that we have? It was clear today that Cindy had been practicing her song and she gave her best of her talents to Christ today. I see the snacks that have been prepared are green desserts. And if I let you know about Cindy Vaughn, one thing that I know is that she is always giving her best when she bakes. Homemade treats. Last week my students asked, is this homemade? They loved the snacks. Ate up all the cookies. My poor college students, eating the cafeteria food for so long, loved the homemade treats. They want to know, is this homemade? I looked, I saw that it was Cindy. It was among them. I knew, yes. What do we give Jesus that is our best? The best of our talents, the best of our time, the best of our possessions. What can we give to Christ. We must learn to give our best. And if we remember the verse, verse 3, maybe we can go back. Let's go ahead and leave it. <laughs> so remember that verse that said that the house was full of the per perfume, the fragrance of the perfume. And why would the author add that verse? Kristen said because he got a headache from the perfume? There's too much of it? I don't think so. I don't think that's the reason. So it's from a plant. There's no added chemicals. So it's from just a plant. So I imagine that it actually smelled pretty good. And so the fragrance permeated the entire house. And the author mentions that in our scripture because every time that we give our best, our best will spread, it will permeate, it will go and spread and people will see and feel inspired and feel good and feel loved and feel worthy. When we give our best of our time and our talents and our possessions, it will all permeate and touch other people. Right? Yeah, Rose said the aroma, the scent, 
We'll be able to see it. We'll be able to feel it. It's so beautiful. I think it's very beautiful when we give our best. And so that's why I say, you know, Tim needs a bike, not a broken bike, but a good bike, a good functioning bicycle. And so it's always important to live, to know, to learn how to give our best. The third point in Mark chapter 14, verse 9, I'm going to share this verse. It says, I tell you the truth. This is Jesus speaking. I tell you the truth. Where the gospel is preached through the world, you will hear the story of Mary. This story of Mary. Washing Jesus' feet. Isn't that so cool? And very truly, 2,000 years later, here I am standing in Deaf International Community Church preaching about who? Who am I preaching about? Mary. The story is still being told. Two th over 2,000 years later, just as Jesus says, I tell you the truth, when this gospel is preached, you will hear of this story. Remember the story about Mary. And this story is still alive 2,000 years later. Why? Why? Because she, in her humility, sat at Jesus' feet and learned from Jesus and gave her best. And we want to remember, and we, if we want, people to remember us as well. My advice is if we want people to remember us in heaven and here on earth, then we should not build monuments for ourselves, but we should build monuments for Christ. And people will remember those acts, those deeds. My MNU students are going to remember homemade cookies for a long time. Amen? Let's pray.